screen and say good morning from the West Coast and good afternoon to the rest of Canada. Um, the uh, Welcome to the Teacher versus Machines uh, Can You Learn Symposium Reprise webinar. My name is Randy Labonte and I'm looking forward to learning with Francois and hearing more. It's uh, his session at the event I was unable to attend but heard great things about it. And Francois has been consulting with the uh, Ministry of Education in Quebec uh, and coordinated the development of the Information Network for Educational Success. So lots of experience uh, in terms of teaching as well as being involved in pedagogical trends. We had an interesting conversation to start about pedagogy and approaches. So I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more about Francois's ideas about teachers versus machines. And uh, I will curate questions. Feel free to text them uh, along the way. For those that are watching the recording, uh, feel free to, uh, to email questions, and I'll put an email address that you can contact us there. And this archive will be posted on the Candy Learn webinars page afterwards. So without further ado, Francois, over to you. Thank you, Randy. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Andy for getting me this opportunity to uh, to present this, uh, this, this presentation, this communication, uh, something I did at uh, Can eLearn. Um, my, my topic, of course, is, is the relation be between, uh, between teachers and technology, uh, machines, if you wish. And the title is not quite appropriate. It should rather be Teachers with Machines. Uh, and we'll be looking at this relationship, which I think is something we have to look into considering the, uh, the acceleration of uh, change. Now, uh, the first thing we, we have to realize, uh, of course, is that we are quite fortunate uh, as educators uh, to be able to work with children. Uh, Randy, I have a bit of a technical glitch here. My, my keynote is not advancing. Uh, um, just make sure that you're in that keynote window. Let's see. You can always refresh your desktop. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, actually, it's a, it's, a, it's an immense responsibility for teachers to be able to, uh, to, to be working in this field because we have to realize that we're the only profession, really, uh, whose uh, daily task is to change the brains of children. And that is something that uh, we must not take lightly. Uh, the, the brain, of course, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit interested in how the brain works, I've always been, and uh, it's, it's just an amazing uh, organ. Uh, and the, every time we, 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 we talk to a child, uh, it's, it's, the child, its neurons will develop about 7,000 uh, 7, connections uh, per second. So that's, that's a lot. And we have to realize, of course, that the brain is a network. We know that. But there's quite a, uh, quite a lot many differences between the brain of a child and the brain of an adult. Uh, the brain of a child will take in information and grow neurons and connections at an astounding rate. Uh, the, the time in, in the life where a child has the most connections is at the end of uh, his childhood, around the age of 12. After that, uh, the brain will start, uh, uh, what do you say, taking out neurons and uh, removing connections to make sense of the world. And that, of course, brings us to the, the, the change that we're experimenting and trying to understand why uh, everything is happening so fast. The, the world population, for one thing, is increasing at an incredible rate. And we cannot sustain such change uh, forever. Something will have to give at one point. Uh, it will plateau at one point. We know that. Uh, but let's look at something here. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the factors that, that fuels change and that drives change is the fact that the world population not only is an increasing, but the literacy rate is also increasing rapidly. And that's a lot of brain power when you think about it. 
And if we try to forecast that and put it in perspective with the future, we can see that by the end of the century, we'll have the world population will have grown, but well, will sort of diminish a little bit, but we'll have a lot of post-secondary educated people. Again, we have a, a higher, a larger population than we have today with a lot of brain power and a lot of education. And the other factor, of course, that drives all this is the fact that the fact that with the internet we're all connected, which adds to the dissemination and the exchange of information and the way we collaborate. And that again fuels uh, this revolution. Now, the a lot of people are saying that we are we are starting the fourth industrial revolution. The first being uh, the steam engine and the mechanical uh, production, and the second being uh, the computers, uh, not the computers, but electricity and mass production, the third being uh, electronics, uh, IT, and automation. But right now we're starting a fourth revolution, which is bioengineering and uh, super artificial intelligence. Where all this will lead us, we don't know, but we have to start thinking about this, about this, especially considering that we are preparing the students for this possible future. Um, and we, we sort of have a tendency of finding it difficult to cope with the, the rate of acceleration of evolution. Uh, computers and technology have evolved very fast. This is one of the first computers here at the University of uh, Philadelphia. And uh, one, one interesting uh, anecdote about this is that when they first turned on this computer, the whole city had a blackout uh, because it just required too much power. But things have evolved, of course. Computers have gotten smaller, uh, mobile in one sense. Uh, and then we have turn to supercomputers. Now this, this IBM uh, 360 here, I've put on the screen because I want you to bear in mind that that's the computer that NASA had at its disposal when it proceeded with uh, the first moon landing. And then we came up with the, the first personal computer uh, in 1976. That's the, the, uh, the first Apple Macintosh. Uh, and it, people had a lot of difficulty coping with this, uh, these new inventions. Even the people who were knowledgeable in the field uh, doubted that it would ever grow at the rate that we now know. Uh, this is a famous quote by Ken Olson, the, the, the uh, president of, of Digital. And uh, the quote has remained, but Ken Olson and the company has disappeared. Now, uh, just to illustrate again the, the rate of acceleration, there are just seven years between these two pictures. And I remember using the computer on the, the left, this Mac, and uh, when the, the iPhone came out, it was quite a revolution. And we know today that it is quite, it has changed society a lot. Everything is going mobile, which we'll be seeing in a second. But one of the things we have to realize is that taking the computer and putting it in a mobile mode uh, made it so that there are a lot of components and functions in an iPhone that do not make sense on a desktop computer. Uh, a, 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 a what you say, a, 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 gyros a gyroscope on a computer does not make any, any, any sense. A GPS on a desktop computer also does not make a lot of sense. There are a lot of sensors that have been incorporated into our mobiles that would make no sense in a desktop computer. And you know, that, that made me realize at one point that the education system had a lot of difficulty in coping with that change. Uh, even today, I know some schools are still banning cell phones and smartphones from their schools, although they are very powerful tools. And you no, know, we all know today that that uh, mobile is eating the world. So that's something we have to prepare our. Our, our students for. Now between 2000 and 2007, 
uh, that's you know, the, the iPhone came about. But what changed in the 10 years between the iPhone and today? What was the big revolution that came about that we could, uh, there were many revolutions, many added functionalities, but one of the things that strikes me as fundamental is the fact that we have incorporated artificial intelligence within our mobiles and Siri was one of the good examples of that and all these digital assistants that uh, are getting to be more and more popular and everyone is, is, is working on these digital assistants. Now, uh, looking at, again, at the rate of, of, of evolution, we, we, we sort of were forecasting that if Moore's law continues to stand, we, we believe that by 2045, our $1,000 laptop will have the computer power of all the brains of humanity put together. That, that's, that's astounding. That's a lot of computing power within our devices. And how will we adapt to that? How will we use that? Will we use it to a good use or to nefarious uses? That is one of the things that we have to deal with and uh, that we must keep in mind. Um, you know, today, our laptop has the same, about the same computing power as the brain of a mouse, which is, which is something considering that a mouse is a mammal and it has a pretty, uh, uh, a brain that is pretty evolved. And we're coming to this point of, that we call the singularity, whereby the machines will just outpower and outsmart uh, uh, human beings in many ways, not in all ways, but in many ways. And we believe that at this point, and we've already started, we'll be entering an era of transhumanity, of augmented human beings with technology and robotics and so on. Uh, we were, we're close to that point. We're starting to see the transition, but my feeling is that we're not giving it a lot of thought as to where we're going with all this. So this idea of transhumanism is, uh, is gaining ground. Some people are working on brain hacking uh, and, and you know, using, putting all kinds of devices and attaching them to their brain and analyzing the, uh, the brain waves and seeing what they can do with that and seeing what kind of interactions they can get with, uh, with the devices. Now we're using a lot of wearable technology as well. We're also uh, devising uh, uh, wearable technology for babies. And the thing here is that we're sort of conditioning children to using devices uh, and without considering what are the ethical issues involved and where that will be. And we're sort of doing it and we're doing the same thing in schools. We are collecting a lot of data uh, that belong to the children really uh, without their consent and without ourselves being sure how that will be used in the future. So we have a, uh, quite a responsibility of doing so in a knowledgeable way and in an ethical way. Now, uh, we are producing a lot of data. We know that. And one of the reasons for that is because of the wearable devices and the Internet of Things, which is coming about. Now, one thing to, that we have to be aware of, of course, is when we're producing all this data, which is in tremendous amounts, is that the data uh, that we are producing, sorry about that, the data that we are producing is not, is not static, it is dynamic. Once it, it is on servers somewhere, it is being treated, it has the potential of being treated. And, and how will it be treated? wisely. Uh, we know that a lot of companies are, are collecting this data, they're selling this data, uh, but it's something else that we are only starting to understand and the legal system, of course, and the educational system is not really pondering the issues uh, that deal with this matter. Again, looking at all the, the student data that we're collecting uh, and not knowing what will come of it. Now, we're also entering a new phase, 
which we call the ambient and computing and cognitive computing, sorry. Uh, and the reason for that is because of all these sensors that we'll be integrating into our mobile devices and on ourselves. Uh, again, this is data that is personal, uh, that is self uh, data. And you know, there's a potential of good use of uh, return to the user that is beneficial, but there are many drawbacks if it is badly used. It, used sorry. And which brings us to the subject of automation, of course, which we're talking a lot about. Uh, and uh, the, the, the forecasts are pretty dire when it comes to the future of some work. Um, Many, many of the, the, the reports that are coming out uh, sort of indicate that about 30 to 40 percent of the workforce will probably be, lose their job because of automation in the next 15 to 20 years. Now, um, economists say we should not worry because uh, automation will create jobs, but the jobs that are not lost are not necessarily the jobs that are created. Therefore, we have to think about the social upheaval that may come from all these people uh, losing their job and perhaps not having the education uh, to make the transfer. Uh, now, what is the likelihood of educators being, uh, of their work being automated? Well, the, some studies indicate that it's very, uh, it's, there's a very poor chance that teachers' uh, work will be replaced by robots. Um, secondary education teachers, out of 366 uh, professions that were analyzed, uh, they came as 357, so very small risk. Same thing for primary uh, education teachers. Now, why is it more probable that they will be automated? Uh, the, the, the reports tend to suggest that some of the tasks of the primary ed teacher are more easily automated. That is very disputable, of course. That's the report's finding. We, can, uh, we don't have to agree with it, but you know, the, 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 the indication is still that there's a lower risk, but we have to be wary of where it comes. Uh, However, the field of artificial intelligence and looking into robotics is, uh, is interesting. There's a lot of experimentation going on. And the reason for that, because you're all very aware that recruiting new teachers is difficult in some countries, especially in Japan, uh, they're at a lack, uh, a miss for teachers. Uh, so they have to find solutions. Now, one of the things that we, that I find interesting is the relationship between children and robots. Uh, knowing that children have, you know, have learned very early to develop a relationship with toys that they take with them. And the way they, inter, uh, they relate to toys and to robots is not the same that adults would. And they accept very easily, know that they could interrelate uh, uh, with a robot. Now, if you add to a robot chatbots, artificial intelligence, this field could evolve very rapidly. Uh, and uh, will we be ready for that? No one knows, of course, but uh, it's something to consider. Uh, now, robotics are are evolving very rapidly. I'm going to show you a video in a second of an actual situation about a teacher in the U.S. Her name is Meredith. And in her class, she's a primary school teacher. Uh, she has an autistic child who, uh, who has been integrated. Now, uh, it's very difficult for Meredith. She's uh, overwhelmed, so she has decided to integrate a robot, and she is working with specialists in the field, uh, an engineer, a programmer, and uh, a design uh, specialist, and they're looking into Meredith's problem, and they are developing programs for the robot, the now robot that I just showed, and while she's working on something else, when she arrives in the morning, the, the, you know, the, the team uh, uh, 
uh, at a distance, they found a solution, and that is that program is wirelessly uploaded to the robot to now, and now can now uh, relate with the students and interact with the child who is autistic. And speaking again about the relationship of children with toys and robots, you know, we know that they will relate to them in a different way than we do. So that's, that's something also to bear in mind. Oops, sorry about the audio here. I forgot to turn that, that audio off. But as you can see, you know, there are technologies, technologies allow us to do things that we have never dreamt about before. So that is uh, something to, uh, to, 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 to consider as well. It's very difficult to plan for the future when we see technologies like that. How will we adapt? Same thing here with uh, virtual reality and the arts. So there are so many things we can do that are, that are astounding. Uh, now we uh, this this is this is something that you know even the, the, the government the Canadian government is looking into this as well. They have people who are looking at the evolution of uh, technology, and we're trying as a society to prepare for the future. And in uh, they had a, this interesting uh, report in two thousand three which was uh, titled Policy Horizons Canada, Canada, and they had they looked at several sectors, and I'm just going to look at one here, which is neurotechnology and cognitive technologies, which I find, which I find interesting, and uh, looking at some of the aspects, where I'm not going to go through all of them, but we're forecasting that eventually we'll have next generation brain to computer interfaces. Uh, so you won't have to use your keyboard, you won't have to type, you'll just simply think, and the computer will understand what you're saying. You'll be able to interact with your computer in this way. Looking uh, even further down the road, we'll have brain-to-brain -brain interfaces. In other words, we'll be able to communicate uh, with one another uh, through, uh, just, just uh, through our thought. Uh, or through other devices, if it need be. Uh, so, you know that that sort of brings about the question on how we evaluate students. Uh, the, the the exam process, the evaluation process, will have to change drastically when we uh, look at that. Um, now, artificial intelligence, of course, is evolving very rapidly. Uh, you're all aware of uh, Watson. We're speaking a lot about Watson. But one of the things I want to show in uh, looking at Watson is the fact that you know, all the machines don't think. You know, they, they're just computing uh, machines. They do what they're told to do, although they are starting to develop languages and learning languages of their own. Let's look at the speed at which this artificial intelligence is working. Uh, so here's a question that was put, this is the version of Jeopardy, where a question was put to the, the uh, contestants on Jeopardy, and the look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the time going by there on the uh, upper right hand corner of the video of the frame, and you can see that the computer is processing the information very rapidly. And will, it will come to the answer uh, in a very short time, uh, very short time. But it's the process. So this is very advanced artificial intelligence. In other words, it's able to take in a question, which is semantics, analyze the semantics of the question, uh, and then go into its database and find the answer to the question. And it did that uh, much more rapidly than the best contestants on Jeopardy, uh, which is a lot faster than we would be able to do, of course. Now, uh, artificial intelligence is, 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 is not human intelligence, right? It's artificial intelligence. It's a different kind of intelligence. Uh, to some degree, uh, what we do, what the human, uh, our intelligence does, it does better than artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, however, there are some things that artificial intelligence can do that it can do better than human intelligence. 
So we have to learn to adapt to that and see how we can uh, we can we can we can master that and not let it run rampant. Now, the when you look at computational uh, thinking, it is quite obvious that the way you know, algorithms function are very close to some functions uh, of, our, of human reason. And that is something that we can use in the classroom when it comes to all this, this, this question of should, learn, should students learn uh, how to program. Uh, I don't think every, all the students should learn to code, uh, write lines of code, but there's something about the way about thought that is fundamental uh, to the way computational thinking is organized and programming is organized as well. So there's something to relate there. Um, the, uh, we, when we look at the miniaturization of uh, computer chips, uh, we're now at the point where we are devising microchips specifically for artificial intelligence. And because these microchips are getting so small, they can be integrated to a lot of devices, even to a USB key and to uh, all kinds of, 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 of uh, other devices, um, which you know, some people are saying, and this is interesting, that instead of developing software today, we're at the point where we could devise, uh, devise and produce hardware for each software application that we are using today uh, with miniaturization and development of hardware it, it could get to that point um, which would make applications a lot faster perhaps not as subtle and as flexible but interesting all the same now looking at education we know that there are a lot of websites out there that allow students to play around with these things, to learn and um, you know, foster some kind of understanding of what artificial intelligence is, even neural networks. Now, um, you've all heard probably that uh, the dire predictions about artificial intelligence, and uh, this is uh, these are not uh, lame brains. Uh, you know, Elon Musk uh, uh, is pretty wary of artificial intelligence. So is Stephen Hawking, uh, and Nicholas Carr uh, made waves when he asked the question of whether Google was making it stupid or not. On the other hand, we have philosophers who think that these new technologies just make it, make it so that we are forced to become intelligent uh, if we learn to adapt to them. And uh, one, of the, one of the sayings, uh, one of the ideas that I think is very promising is the fact that these new technologies that artificial intelligence in a way will force us to rethink what thought is and get a better understanding of what really makes us human what makes us different without having to do menial use our intelligence for menial chores that uh, we do automatically but again that is uh, something that's just food for thought. Now, of course, the, 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 one of the, the greatest threat, in my opinion, is not artificial intelligence. It's the way that we're sort of using our biases uh, to adapt to this instead of being, being uh, looking at innovative way of adapting to these new technologies and not being intellectual lazy. Now, uh, this will probably um, uh, bring some controversy, but according to the specialists who look into, uh, into, the, into neuroscience, uh, they, 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 you know, they say that any typical, uh, again, I think typical, typical here is important, any typical internet use will not harm the adolescent brain. Uh, the question is, are we teaching them to use this in a balanced uh, way? Uh, which is which is quite a challenge. The perhaps one of the the solutions to the evolution of artificial intelligence is the 
the development of open AI, I think there's a there's there's some kind of security to uh, to be gained from putting all the artificial intelligence out there in the open and letting humanity uh, making it evolve. Uh, that being said, uh, our brain is still no, a lot more powerful than supercomputers. Uh, as I've said before, our brain can do things that artificial intelligence can't do. Artificial intelligence is very good at specific things. When it comes to looking at things globally, nothing beats the, the, the brain, especially since it's very energy efficient. Uh, it, it uses a lot less energy than a supercomputer does. Uh, it's just a marvel of natural evolution. Uh, and of course, we, we have to learn to harness that. And the, the, the idea I think that we have to, to, to promote is that artificial intelligence and new technologies are a way of augmenting ourself uh, and finding ways of augmenting who we are and who we are uh, for the benefit of society, of course, but using it in a an augmented way uh, instead of, of resisting the, the change. We have to adapt, otherwise technologies will evolve so fast that they will outpace us. Uh, and I'll get back to that later in a theory that I have or the proposal for understanding the relationship between uh, human beings and technology, which is what I'll bring about right now. I'm, I'm sort of in a, in a philosophical way, I, I would like to take a moment to look at the relationship between man and technology. Uh, and the first thing we have to take into account is that obviously we, we, we interact with technology. You know, there's, we cannot deny that. There is an interaction between us and technology. And it's been going on for, for almost since the beginning of our evolutions, ever since we've started being uh, Homo sapiens, we have learned to to develop and and create technology. Now, of course, technology here is not just digital technology. It's it's I'm looking at it in a, in a general sense. The second thing we can we can state is that man is not technology. We're different from technology. However, we are sort of tied to technology. Uh, it is part of us. So that's who we have become. Uh, you know, if, uh, I don't think we could live without technology. Technology has sort of uh, uh, formed who we are, uh, and we are forming technology, but there's a, there's a symbiosis there. If I was to take you and drop you in the jungle with nothing, uh, I, I don't know how long you would survive. And in order to survive, you would have to look around, take your knowledge, and create things in order to survive. So we are the technology that we create in a sense. Now, uh, looking again at the relationship, in some respect, we are superior to technology. And in other times, technology is superior to what we can do. That's why we create things, which is to facilitate the relationship between us and the environment. Now, the, one of the things that we've noticed is that when man has, has mastered technology, it gives it a, an edge over technology by itself. Uh, just to give an example, we've noticed that although, although artificial intelligence can be, can be chess players, you take a good chess player and you give it the, the give it, you let it work with technology, with artificial intelligence, it will beat the, the, the computer program. And, um, same thing you know, when we look at the advantage of having man who can master technology, he does have an advantage over man. Now, we are at the age of network. And uh, again, that's something that is quite, uh, quite powerful uh, using, using networks. Uh, if we learn how to use network and look at collective intelligence and us as a society being able to connect and work together, that provides in some respect, some advantage over technology. Uh, same thing if technology is being put, uh, is being networked and we know with the internet of 
things and everything coming up that technology will be will be a network so we have to maintain our superior superiority over that uh, and again looking at same thing here with man being network using technology being network we can sort of hypothesize that we would have an advantage over technology being network um, uh, but the purpose of all this, seeing that everything is being networked, the challenge today is for us to be of learning how to work as a network with the advantage of technology as a network. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what will happen in the future, but we have to sort of see that as an objective as to our understanding of how technology is evolving today. So that, to me, sort of is the, the, the goal of education today is to prepare the students for that future where they have to, to have the, the skills to work as a, in a network and having to learn things that are networked. And of course, that's not, it's getting away from this humanistic approach uh, and one of the critics that we have of humanism is that humanism is very ethnocentric. You know, it's, it, it, it looks at man, at the man himself, whereas man is not alone. He, he, he lives in an environment. He's, he, has to, he has to deal with the environment. And we could imagine that one of the, the future uh, and our, our survival is probably linked to to how we can use artificial intelligence in our relation to the environment, knowing that without that, we have sort of come to the, the edge of a precipice uh, in our relation to the environment. So hopefully, if we can use data and we can use artificial intelligence, there's a chance that we can better deal and cope with our planet. So to me, it's all a matter of, 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 of accepting technology, but learning how to, how to master it. Uh, and if we look at education, I'm going to go, I'm going to start looking at how schools have evolved and looking at pedagogy. Uh, you know, at one point, we sort of foresaw that, that technology will be, would be integrated in the school. And now at, in, in those days, pedagogy was not what it is today. We did not have that pedagogical, pedagogical and scientific knowledge about learning that we have today. So this is how we foresaw the classroom. Now, unfortunately, if we look at many classroom, it hasn't changed much. We still have a teacher at the front who is, who is, well, this is a cliche, of course. I'm not saying that that's what happened in the classroom, but the context and the environment hasn't changed a lot. There's no way of telling what the students are doing in this picture, but the, 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 the paradigm is pretty, pretty much the same. And we have to be careful about this because if we're not changing our ways, we may find that, that devices, are, uh, and, and especially intelligent devices, will be much smarter than we are and better at teaching than we will. And students are not, they're, 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 they're not dumb. They will see that well, if they can learn faster on their devices, they will lose interest in the schooling system. Uh, now, we're all familiar with the 21st century skills. I'm not going to go into that uh, deeply because uh, a lot has been said about it. I like the, uh, the OECD framework because it leads to action and competencies and everything is being integrated. Uh, looking at knowledge, however, uh, uh, I have a feeling and I've noticed that a lot of educators, a lot of teachers um, don't quite grasp what knowledge is. Uh, and we see it a lot in teachers who are just, just passing along the information and trans transmitting information. Uh, I, personally, I like the, the IKW uh, model, which starts from data, and uh, data could be seen here in, uh, as we could use a, an allegory or a metaphor and see that data is like words, they're, 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 they're concepts. 
uh, they're just it's just just something that is stata, which does not have meaning in itself. You know, if I if I give you the word table, you will picture a table, but in what context and what meaning? Uh, it says very not a lot. Now data that has been compiled and that has, has been strung together in a sentence, for example, becomes information. That has a lot more meaning. And a lot of the things that I am uh, uh, providing today, that I'm saying today to a lot of you is information. Before it becomes knowledge, it is something that has to be integrated, has to be thought of, it has to be assimilated. So it takes some time and quite a lot of time for information to become knowledge, something we can use. And the interesting thing here about one of the important uh, uh, differences between information and knowledge is that information is usually something that is the input that we all receive in the same way. We all receive the same information. But the way we treat it, the way we process it, uh, it becomes knowledge that is very individualized. Uh, it is processed differently according to the students and the people. Therefore, uh, knowledge will vary to some extent. And, of course, the last level is that of using our knowledge in a wise way. That's the, the goal and the objective. And the, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I, I keep telling a lot of, of teachers that although they may not be the IT knowledgeable, they still have this degree of wisdom about society that they can put to good use. But that is if you have an open mind, of course. Now, um, we all know that learning theories are many, that it's very complicated. I just want to illustrate one point here and simplify things. And I like Mac's model that I will illustrate here because uh, it says a lot to me and it allows us to understand where we're going with this. Uh, we know fundamentally that knowledge and, and learning is mostly, is fundamentally cognitive. Now there's a second layer where we know that learning is also social. Uh, looking at the people around us and the, the information that we get is mostly produced by society. So that aspect of course increases the amount of uh, input that we, we, we have. Now there's a third layer here, and that is the theory of connective learning and uh, connectivism by Siemens and, Down, and Downs, whereby knowledge is something that is disseminated and our learning ability is the skill by which we are able to navigate the networks and access all this information. Now, of course, all that is intertwined. It's all network. It's not one theory. And um, the other thing that we have to, uh, that I want you to realize is that the, the, uh, the, the quantity, there's a quantified aspect in this, in this diagram. You know, the, the, the outer the, the, the circle, the more information, the more data there is. Now there's a fourth aspect that we should consider that we could add to, add to this model, and that is machine learning. That's all the data that is processed outside in the cloud on our devices and that we should be able to relate to. Now we know that networks are distributed. And that's, 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 that's something, of course. But uh, looking at uh, all the artificial intelligence that can be put to edu into educational use and uh, adaptive learning, um, learning analytics, and so on and so forth, that's something that, is, that we have to learn to master. Right now, Learning analytics are mostly put to the use of the institutions, uh, but very little to the use of the learner himself. So that's something we have to learn to do. Um, and looking at this notion of affordances, uh, I know what, what, what computers, what objects allow us to do when we relate to them and how we imagine actions. Uh, three things I would like to point out here that I think are very powerful is that our di digital devices are, they are creative affordances. All our computers allow us to create so much. And we haven't seen the end of this evolutionary process. The second uh, uh, thing we can state is that social media as a whole are collective 
affordances. They allowed us to, to exchange information and use our collective intelligence. And again, that's something that we still have to harness and develop. And all this, the, the, the realm of digital, uh, because of its plasticity, allows us and, and, and allows for pedagogical affordances. So coming to the end of my presentation here, the perhaps this idea of using devices and artificial intelligence to help the students uh, uh, no, learn, probably there's this possibility that we will solve Bloom's two sigma problem. Now this is something we don't know a lot about Bloom, but when he analyzed the data, he noticed that the students who had one-on-one -on -one mentorship, uh, that the, 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 the the curve of the, the of achievement within the classroom was much higher than a conventional classroom. But Bloom's problem was that he realized that with, in, in, in his day, uh, systems could not allow for a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. It was just not enough people to do that, and it would cost too much. But perhaps if we can use learning devices uh, in a smart way, we can take the learning devices and help the students progress with the help of a teacher. Of course, I'm not trying to eliminate the teacher, but perhaps we could use these digital assistants from in a learning perspective and the mentoring perspective to help all the students achieve and, uh, and su succeed, uh, knowing that all the students are different. So again, this is, uh, this is uh, on a humoristic uh, note here. Uh, the internet technologies will not go away, so it's very, it's very important for schools to think again about their uh, strategies. So there you go. I was say, thought, uh, talking a lot, I'm sorry about that, quite rapid. It's not like seeing people in a room. Uh, very little interaction on my part. I'm sorry about that. I didn't have time to look at the chat room, but uh, if you do have any questions or comments, really, I think comments are more important than questions. Uh, let's see if we can, uh, can have a discussion going. Absolutely, Francois. Wow. Okay, my head's spinning. My brain is full. I think you hit on so many topics and areas that I would love to just delve into uh, with you in depth. Um, it's There's a whole number of things. Uh, at the end of it, you brought it back to robotics to me, and that my robot assistant is Siri or will grow to be an extension of Siri and, and be in my classroom uh, as part of that. And And I think that that's there's a number of telling things that came through to me um, that were there. But I, w I have one question that I want to ask, but I'll wait and open it up to others who want to text a question uh, or, and or use the mic. Feel free. You can open up the mics from here, and we can continue to go from there. So Mary in the text chat asked, how is mastering learning defined? Yes, I saw that. Um, well, I think the first one is kind of sage on the stage. And then the second loop was, I, I assume it was, I don't know, maybe social constructivist teaching. I don't know what that, you know, I'm kind of equating like that in my head. And then the third one is the best of the best, but this, this um, advantage of having technological devices that can more precisely meet the learner exactly or one step ahead of where the learner is, you know? Is that, is that how you define mastery? Like, how did you define mastery learning? Or how did whoever did that chart define mastery learning? <laughs> um, well, I, th I, th I think perspectives will vary on a definition of mastering learning, whether you look at it from the teach teacher's perspective or from the learning, uh, the learner's perspective. Uh, perhaps one way of, of um, fusing uh, both, uh, both sides of the, of the, of the, the, the concept is looking at method. Uh, I, I, think, I think mastering learning is having each student and the teacher having a good enough conceptual knowledge of the method of learning. How does learning uh, happen? Um, and there are, I think there are many mechanisms by which learning happens. So if you do have a, 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 a sort of, of understanding of several ways by which you, you, you may learn, you'll be better tooled to go about learning. And here we're mostly into metacognition. We're mostly into learning to learn. Uh, 
but uh, well, to me, sorry to <laughs> interrupt, but is I, I and I know I'm interrupting. Sorry about that. But what I'm what I'm hearing from you is that the mastery learning is a good pedagogue without the benefits of of this actual uh, technological affordances that really, you know, these super specific ones that can uh, help you, you know, each student in the class or even an amazing pedagogue can't reach every student simultaneously or anything like that. So it's, it's the, the value added of those things. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I think, I think autonomy is very important in a learning perspective. We have to bring the learners to be autonomous in, in how, they, how they proceed. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the tools are important, but we have to realize today that we simply, I, I hear a lot of teachers say that computers are, are not all that dangerous. They're, they're just tools like any other tools. They're not tools like any other. They are starting to become intelligent tools and they are starting to become tools that learn by themselves. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that we have to learn to uh, harness, really, to, to how do we adapt and how do we, how do we use the, these devices and how can they enhance learning? Because you know, I had a discussion with uh, Randy before we came online, and he was saying how he had to change his teaching in order to to learn how to use these new technologies. Mm -hmm. what, what new approaches could he develop? How could he transfer that to the students? Because to me, learning is mostly from the individual point of view. You can teach, that is the teacher's perspective, and the learner is always within the student, but of course the teacher is also a student himself. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's always from the, from the individual uh, way of, of, of the person himself. Right. And that varies from person to person according to his background, his prior knowledge, and so it's very complicated. Well, I could ask many questions, but I'm sure somebody else has something to ask as well. I'm, I'm not sure whether Larry does, but I do have a question for the audience, and I'm going to pose and encourage people who watch the recording to come to the end of this. So you brought up a number of different issues uh, around um, technology and its interactions in our world, in uh, our futures, and what potentially we're moving towards um, in, in our lives, and what, how do we rationalize that in education as teachers? So I think that a cell phone ban does not equate to a, a, a network human plus the, the network technology that you describe as sort of the ultimate in terms of where we, we need to be. So my question back to you, Francois, is what can our typical classroom teacher actually do to begin to shift towards that networked human and networked technological future that you're describing? <laughs> That's a tricky question, Randy. <laughs> well, the sense it could, one or two things that you think that, that, like I can do in my practice. Yes, well, that will, I think, obviously that will vary according to where the teacher is at and what he feels comfortable with. Uh, you know, just accepting to take risks and go forward uh, is important. Um, taking risks is, again, but not being afraid of the, 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 the how you say, the, the, the chaos that will come at first from taking the risks uh, and experimenting. And to me, it's a lot of matter of trust with, it, with, with, with the, the students. Uh, if, if, if there's no trust between the teacher and the students, it's very difficult to bring about the change. Uh, it's, um, it, I would work mostly on, on this, this teacher-student relationship uh, to, to see how far we can go and, and how we can do it. It's, uh, I know it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really a tricky question. I, I, I've done things in my classroom that, uh, that I was able to do because I believe that I had a good relationship with my students. Uh, but the, the fact that teachers are still banning uh, smartphones and these technologies is sort of like admitting the failure of the education system of moving forward. Uh, the education system should be about coping with difficulties such as this. Uh, and if, if you're just uh, 
just abnegating these these okay. difficulties, you're 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 admitting that you're uh, that you're inefficient. I, I think it's interesting to go back to your teacher and machine as the two sort of benchmark areas that to me teaching is about creating those comfortable supportive learning environments and that machines are about supporting the activities and actions which we're trying to create and facilitate in those environments um, yes. so and, and it's not the teachers that are necessarily banning cell phones it's how we organize for learning so to me my passion to cry is to do something and we uh, earlier this week we had ottawa catholic uh, school board um, teachers and a student come and talk about what it is that they're doing. And Ottawa Catholic as a board made an organizational commitment to support innovation, to support risk, and to support alternative pedagogies and ways and views of moving forward. And they took the conventional measures of standardized tests uh, and those kinds of things which drove the system, and they put them aside. So I think that to achieve what it is that you're describing, our focus is around creating those environments that are safe. I think that why maker spaces are coming forward as being uh, places for this to happen, why blended or flipped learning or using technology to support alternate environments are, are part of that change in structure. So, um, but I, I think you've laid down a blueprint around how the integration of technology can and should be used based on other experiences and other things that are happening in our networked worlds. Yes, you touched on something, Randy, that I think is important to single out, and it's the fact that in our education culture, uh, for a long time, uh, we have you know, this, uh, this idea of accepting failure. And, and, and integrating failure in the learning process. Uh, you know, the, these, the, the maker movement, uh, maker spaces, they, they are bringing about this and they're changing our attitude towards, towards failure and seeing it as a normal process. Mm -hmm. So our whole, our, whole, our whole assessment and evaluation uh, approach to learning has to be rethought and has to be put in, in light of what we know about learning. Absolutely. Um, Mary, you have more questions, but you also, Francois, is it okay if I put the, your email address in the text chat area? Mary had asked about it. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. Uh, I can't remember what my questions are. I'm just enjoying this completely. Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice of you. I, it, it is. It's a fascinating conversation and dialogue, one which, I, as I, I said, Mary, after listening, as, as you did, I'm going like, I want to go back to the beginning and let's talk in more in depth about this notion that you brought forward. Yes, yes. And then as soon as I'm going like, oh, this is really exciting, and then, then you introduce another notion, it's like, wow, okay, yes, I want to talk about yes. that. <laughs> no, I, I really do um, appreciate, I've learned a lot, and um, I want to get in touch with you, Francois, so I'll do that. My pleasure, Mary. Thank you. Absolutely. That was terrific. So Francois, I will post the recording. I can't thank you enough, but I'm also wondering whether or not there's any um, part of your presentation that you have posted somewhere that we could also put a link to for, through the Canny Learn, and then I uh, would certainly highlight some of this in newsletter and information that's sent out. Yes. Um, did I send you the, uh, the, the, the slide share link to, to the, uh, the, the um I the think, visual? Actually, I think you did for the part of the symposium. Okay, I will. I will. Well, listen, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, okay. Box thank there. you very much. Okay. Thank and you very much. Bye bye. Your question. Well, thank you both. Thanks. I'll take care, and I'll wait for that to uh, for you to post that link so it's in the recording. Yep. And. Let's uh, see. And then, uh, yeah, sorry about the, uh, the horns. It's 12 o'clock in Vancouver, and they have an old Canada horn that goes off every time at noon here. Well, I, I just I, I didn't keep track of time, but I noticed that we just took an hour, so that's, that's okay. Yeah, that was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, Mary came back in for the link, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going a bit fast there, so um, it's, it's very different. I, I don't like really speaking yet. In a camera, it's uh, the fantastic. I just put the recording back on, so there's a link to the slide share um, that's in the chat message. I'll put it back there for those that are watching the recording. It will also be posted on the um, Candy Learn website. 
So on behalf of the folks that were here, as well as those that are going to watch the recording, uh, Francois, fa fascinating. And, and I know now why when Michael Canuel came out and he said, wow, that was an incredible presentation. Uh, You're too kind. And it was wonderful. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you for the opportunity, Randy. Nice, nice talking to you. Absolutely. Yes, I look forward to our future conversations. Yep, so do I. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Take care.